Hey, welcome back to I Am, the podcast that explores the possibilities and potential that we can access as human beings. I'm your host, Johnny Wilkinson. I hope you enjoy this podcast coming up. Jeff Foster's an amazing guy. He's got some phenomenal stories. He's a great storyteller. His message is deep and inspiring. His story is a powerful one. But the way he delivers it so humbly, so openly, the way it meanders and finds its way back to the core messaging, some of them have stuck with me hugely. He's also got uh, a really vibrant, energetic kind of presence and a brilliant laugh as well uh, that makes this a, an upbeat and very enjoyable easy listen this also brings us to the end of the series and it's been an absolute uh, pleasure to be on this journey and as i keep saying it's been so awesome having you on it too i hope you've had a great time with this series please keep sending in your thoughts your ideas and letting us know what's going on in your world I'm really enjoying hearing from anyone listening in. So if something arises in you, thoughts, feelings, or anything that you feel you want to know more about, do not hesitate to email me uh, on hello at iampodcast.co.uk or just leave a comment in the review section on Apple Podcasts. And we will continue to prep and to look forward to the next series. Uh, We can't wait to get stuck in with new guests uh, and I can't wait to catch up with you again really, really soon. Until then, my name is Johnny Wilkinson. This is the I Am Podcast with Jeff Foster. Jeff Foster, thank you for joining me today. Um, I understand you haven't done a podcast for a while and uh, we are one of your first back in. So thank you ever so much for letting us uh, have that privilege. Oh, oh, wow, Johnny. Yeah, thank you so much for letting me be here. And, and yeah, this is my first podcast since I got sick. I think it was late 2019 and yeah it just it this all just kind of worked out i'm well enough now i i'm ready to you know i'm teaching again and ready to i was open to doing podcasts and then you you plopped it well you didn't plop but <laughs> your invitation plopped it plopped into my into my consciousness so it's all it's happening i'm aware that um we should do some background stuff and i wondered rather than sort of get you to talk about what it is you do and all those things I, i'm really really intrigued and interested for this podcast and for myself more than anything it's about human potential and I'm interested in your story a little bit around what you might I don't know describe as a, your biggest shift an awakening experience or whatever it might be but can you give us just a little bit as much as you're willing to tell us about that to frame this this next hour or so sure yeah so the big shift happened for me in my early 20s hmm. I'll, I'll tell you the short version and then maybe we can unpack it a bit. I, I was extremely depressed in my, well, as a teenager, actually as a, as a child, but as a teenager, it got worse and worse. In my early 20s, I basically reached the point, I think I was 22, 23 years of age. I, I reached the point where I didn't really want to live anymore. The depression was just so deep, this self-hatred, anxiety, the shame, I, I just just this feeling at my very core of not being good enough. You know, and just not being enough. I, I felt ugly. I felt stupid. I mean, I, I was, you know, I, I went to Cambridge University. I, I, I On the outside, I had all the shiny things. You know, I was a good boy. But on the inside, I just felt, I felt like there was this black hole and, and nothing seemed to be able to fill it. And um, it, it's all a bit blurry now. It, honestly, it feels like I'm talking about another life or something. Or, you know, I'm, it feels like I'm talking about another person when, when I talk about this period of my life. But back then, I, <laughs> I wanted to be a, a filmmaker. Like uh, My whole childhood, I could do a whole podcast on that, but I wanted, to be a, I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to tell stories. I wanted to inspire people, but it didn't quite work out. In my early 20s, I, I ended up working at the BBC in London, BBC News, I, in like a technical support role. I, I was in this relationship with this with this girl, this woman. I, I thought we were going to get married. I was completely in love with her. She was my soulmate. She was going to save me. And then, of course, she, she left me. That so often happens. And I just fell into this deepest despair of my life. I, I, I hated my job. I felt lost in my life. I didn't know what I was. I didn't know who I was. I did not know who I was. I knew who I was supposed to be. I knew who I'd been taught I was, but in, in the deepest being, I didn't know who I was. And so then my, my girlfriend left me. And then I got, um, I got really ill. I got, I got physically sick. One day I ended up collapsing in my apartment. I was taken to hospital. 
It was probably, it was the lowest point of my life. And I think this is what sparked the, the spiritual search when I really look back. When I, I collapsed in the shower one day, I started... I started vomiting blood. I think I, I think I had taken too many ibuprofen because I was feeling. I, I didn't know what was wrong with me at the time. Turns out it was glandular fever. But anyway, I started vomiting blood. I ended up passing out. I woke up with my head on on the base of the shower in a pool of blood. Absolutely terrified, thinking that I was dying. And I think there was something about that 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 moment facing death started something in me. And then when, when I was in the hospital. And they were running all the tests. I remember this this question emerging, which was like, "What, what is death and what is life?" And these these questions I'd never even I'd, I'd never asked before. These suddenly these these deep deep philosophical, spiritual, ontological questions like, became so important to me. Like, what, who am I, and what what's death? Like, life, God, life is so fragile. Like, one moment you're working at the BBC doing technical support for Jeremy Paxman or whatever, and the next moment I'm on the I'm like vomiting blood and 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 of, and of course, like I mean, my life wasn't actually in, in danger, but I didn't know. That, but you don't know at the time. You don't know at the time. I think that that's began my spiritual search. I, I wanted, you know, I was again. I was so deeply depressed. I, there was this black hole inside of me, and now, and now, this question is now the, these these questions became the most important questions in my life. Like they really, these questions really started burning in me. Like, who who am I? What what is life? What does it mean to be alive? And and what's what's the meaning of my life? And if life is so fragile, in any in any moment, you know, it can just be we can we can get sick or we can die. Like, what does it all mean in the in the face of that? It, starting in hospital, this was the beginning of my period of my life where I became the world's most obsessed spiritual seeker. <laughs> I, I I got my hands on some. Someone gave me a spiritual. I mean, at, at that point in my life, I'd never even heard of the word spirituality. I had no, I, no idea what spirituality was. I think it was a book by Eckhart Tolle or something. Someone gave me. Suddenly, the most important thing in my life was to find this thing called. I mean, it's, people use different names to point to it, but en- enlightenment, liberation, that sense of oneness, wholeness, that that thing that we're all looking for it, it was for me now it was a, a question it was a matter of life of life or death like i have to find this thing because i can't live like this anymore i can't you know it was it was like i mean this may sound a bit dramatic but it, it did it's how it felt to me at the time is I, either i'm going to find enlightenment or i'm going to kill myself oh, wow. because i can't i can't i can't go on like this i need that i need that that thing enlightenment that nirvana that that you know all the all the spiritual teachers were talking about all the books and the you know so really for the next few years i i honestly i i became just totally obsessed with enlightenment with trying to get this thing called um enlightenment i read every spiritual book i could get my hands on i meditated for hours like hours and hours and hours every day i did all the all the practices and all the methods and all the like oh just trying, basically trying to, to get there, like trying, I wanted this thing called, you know, this other place that didn't include pain and sorrow and anxiety and fear and suffering and this body, you know, with its pains and its mortality and its, and, and this mind with its thoughts that wouldn't stop and its negativity. I, I, back then, that's, that's what I thought the answer was, was to, was to escape. I have to escape this this being human because it's uh, it's too much. Like it's it's too intense. It's too scary. It's it's overwhelming. So um yeah, I obsessively for the next few years actually I obsessed. It was that was the only thing I did in my life. I, I locked myself away at, at home, and I obsessively looked for enlightenment. And and um, that's part one of the story. Well, in in a way, I, I kind of I'd be more than happy for you to to go on because I, I think I get the feeling. You're going to resolve some of those initial interpretations. This is like it's it. like a good Netflix show, isn't it? It's yeah, like it is. A, it's like a that 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 was season one, season <laughs> episode one. one. <laughs> that was the that was the cliffhanger, and and there's lots of things that really really resonate with me, especially around a kind of crux crisis moment or a series of crises moments that just are insurmountable to the stance that I was in. And, and the way that I saw myself, the way that I figured life was, all that packaged together in, in this idea of who I who I was, 
it meets a situation of which there is no win. Yeah. It's doomed if I do, doomed if I don't, and sitting still and doing neither is the biggest doom. And and therefore something has to give. And the thing is, is it's not going to be life. <laughs> Life's not going to give. And I think that for me was where I kind of found that this understanding was, it came to that. I'd had, like you said, the shiny things. I'd had all of those and they they just hadn't moved the dial at all. They were just more extreme versions of what I already knew. And even in the more extreme versions, they also brought more extreme versions of the the unwanted with it. Um, and what, and what, what you also had was the world pointing at you. You're, you you were the shiny thing. Like you 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 had a lot of people all over the world. Like Johnny, he he has it. He's got it. He he's the you know. You had that coming towards you. Well, I I guess also with it, there was this understanding that it felt like this was as good as it was going to get. Yeah. I couldn't ask for any more. And every day that I lived was moving further away from it because it was becoming more old news. Mm. And yet it wasn't even good enough at the start. And now I was moving away from it. There's a sense of like, oh my God, is this it? Uh, mixed with the fact that I had, growing up, you mentioned about the depression. I had, I guess that as a child, I had a huge fear and anxiety and, and panic and sense of doom around life in general, which then led to this depressive states of God, how the hell am I gonna, survive this or beat this or or how is it so easy for everyone else to walk around laughing when I you know when I'm looking thinking how can you laugh when dealing with mortality at a young age or or it was you know this sense of like you can't the perfectionism or whatever it might be all of that kind of hugely hugely resonates and I guess also with me as a youngster there was also that sense of wonder about you know who I am and what it's all about but it didn't have that burn to it that you mentioned and then all of a sudden with the crisis moments it takes front center stage instead of it being you know almost way back in the deepest back seat just kind of plugging along as a nice little curious idea as a you know, dinner party conversation and suddenly it's like no this has replaced everything that was at the front and now it's in the bay but it didn't mean that and i'm interested in this for you in terms of your sort of passion and, and excitement and stuff like that is that how did that shift relate with your everyday life with the stuff that you know with with job earning money relating to friends having goals ambitions hobbies excitements those kind of things how did it now look with this obsessive desire i mean the other thing i want to move on to is definitely what that initial idea of it was actually maybe we'll go there first in terms of as an achiever an idea yeah an achiever for me when i got into that idea of oh i want this other place what it meant was it just became the new world cup yeah yeah and and you're on your way there and you're kind of like oh my god i've got to realize at some point i'm gonna if i win that world cup it's going to be the same as the old one <laughs> yeah so I'm, yeah. I'm interested to see how that how that kind of unfolds now your view of like i've got to go out and get this enlightenment this other place away from the yeah, the escape from pain how did that sort of evolve through the the years the next years season two Season two. No, yeah, it's it's interesting looking back now. I I I kind of really I think I, I realized that I I think I was addicted actually. I, I think that had become my new addiction was spiritual enlightenment. It's all it's all I could think of. All, literally from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed at night, it's all I could think about was this other place. Call it enlightenment. Call it liberation. Call it a sh a shift in consciousness. Call it transcendence. Call it blah blah blah. blah. There's a million names for it. Basically, home, home, you know, that's, I mean, lots and lots of fancy names for something that deep down I was really looking for, which was like, I want to, I want to go home. Where is home? Because I certainly did not feel at home where I was. I did not feel at home in my body, in my mind. I, I think deep down, I, I just wanted to go home, but I, I didn't know how. No one had shown me where home was. My parents bless them, but they they didn't have a bloody clue where 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 home was, you know. And their parents and their parents going back through the the generations, and so it's up to people like us. I think we're the, we're the ones who break down, you know, the sensitive ones, the the creative ones, the artistic ones, the the you know, we break down. And as and as you said, you know, all all the all of these questions, all of this material that it had been buried in me, you know, it would, like you had been buried in you since you were very, very young. It, it's not like it came out of nowhere. It was already there. It was just deeply buried. And now suddenly 
it hits, it smacks you in the face, and it, and it's like the, all the pain of a lifetime, the sorrow, the the abandoned child with within, the 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 the, the, the homesick one. You can't you can't stuff it down anymore, and all the shiny things, and it's it's a really scary, disorienting, difficult time when it's like, oh shit, all the stuff doesn't work anymore, all the shiny stuff, the 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 success, the trophies, for it, it could be anything, the the alcohol, the drugs, the the sex, the all the stuff that you use to to try and run away from yourself, basically, to, to numb yourself, doesn't work anymore. And, and so anyway, that's that's where I found myself. So I, yeah, I, I became obsessed. I read every spiritual book I could find. I, I, every teacher did all the practices, the yoga, the meditation. The... And you know what, over those few years, I mean, I had all this. So here's the thing. I, I started to have all kinds of spiritual experiences, right? You know, I had all the I'd be sitting for hours in meditation and I, I suddenly I'd see the light. I'd tr- I'd, I would fly off to different universes and I, you know, I'd experience different states of all kinds of different states of consciousness. You know, you have these, all, uh, you know, I'd have these orgasmic, you know, oneness experiences and, and experiences where my mind would just completely be silent, experiences of no thought, experiences where I, I was not the body anymore. I transcended the body. I, I, I experiences of, of, you know, astral traveling and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and it was all very exciting. It was all very exciting, all these spiritual experiences. The problem was with these experiences is they had a beginning and an end. They they kind of came and went. Even in the most orgasmic, blissful, you know, almost overwhelmingly <laughs> blissful spiritual experience. It's beautiful, but it passes. It it trickles through your fingers and it, and it's gone. And then you you want it back. Or you want you want a more intense spiritual experience. You want the next insight, the next experience, the next state. You you taste the hundred and forty fifth level of bliss consciousness. Oh my God! There's a hundred and I just forgot the okay. number. Hundred. There's the next level. One hundred and forty seventh level. Hundred. Where does it end? And you start to realize this is what I started to realize actually. This is this is addictive. And then I. <laughs> I mean, it's funny now. It it wasn't at the time. I can look back at it and, and, and I find the humor in it, but it, when, when you're in it, it's kind of tragic, as, as, as I'm sure you can relate to. I started to realize, oh my God, even, even this isn't going to do it. This is the next, oh my God, this was my last hope. This is what I was telling myself at the time. This is all the shi- the external shiny things of the world aren't going to do it, aren't going to bring me home, aren't going to bring me that happiness, that peace, that freedom, that liberation that I'm looking for. But now I started to started to dawn on me that shit even the spiritual experiences aren't going to do it and that I kind of I think I, I kind of entered a, an even deeper despair than I'd ever I mean I you know I thought I was depressed before but this was even deeper now this was like uh, there's a it was a spiritual teacher called um Yuji Krishnamurti and he said something that <laughs> I love he said when it comes to freedom when it comes to liberation when it comes to getting there this other place he said that the mind the mind is not the instrument and there is no other instrument. And when I heard that, I, I remember, oh my God, that it, it, I think it, it sent me into just days and days of absolute despair. Because, well, if, 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 if the spiritual search isn't going to do it, then what's left? So, so uh, yeah, so this is really the point that I came to after two or three years of intense spiritual seeking is even the spiritual experiences weren't doing it for me anymore. Is, is, this, where, is this where the exhaustion... Of the of of the of the seeker comes in. Yeah, that's exactly what started to happen. This this, this exhaustion. It was it was exhausting doing this spiritual seeking, trying trying to get to this other place and reading all the I mean, all the books. I had like thousands and I think had thousands of spiritual with all the fancy Sanskrit words and all the and all the different teachers. All the different teachers seemed to be saying something different. One said. Consciousness is the only reality, and, and awareness is false. And the other teacher said, "No, no, no. Awareness is the old, the only reality, and consciousness is." And one said that you have to be the subject of the awareness of the witness of the object, and the other book said, the, "No, you have to be the awareness of the awareness of the awareness of the of the subjective." Con-. And the other book said, "You have to be. You have to. No, no. You have to transcend all that." You, and, then, and then another book, "No, no, no. You have to transcend the transcendence." So then you're like trying to transcend the transcendence of the one who's transcending, and. <laughs> It's even exhausting talking about. I mean, it was exhausting even talking about it now. But the thing is, it was it was deadly serious to me at the time, and, and that's why I think I became. There's a madness to it. I started to see there's a kind of madness, but then I couldn't get out of it either, because I couldn't. As I was in this really dark place, it's like, 
but I can't get, uh, this is my last hope, but it's not working and, I, and I, I'm seeing through it. I'm always trying to get somewhere else, but then I can't, I can't, how do I give that up? And I can't go back, I can't go back. Like you said, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't go back, but this isn't, you know, so I, this, this, this profound exhaustion. Yeah, I think that's really the word, this profound exhaustion with all the techniques and the practices and the trying to be the awareness of the awareness or being the awareness or being, the, you know, it was exhausting. And as I said, you know, you, you'd have some beautiful experiences. Yeah, but they would pass. And I, I think I was looking for that. What I was looking for was some kind of permanent state or experience. And that's why I started, this leads into season three. That's why I started to realize is it, it's, it ain't going to happen. Maybe what I'm looking for is not some other state or some other experience or some, the next thing. From my perspective and, and listening to this and, and what's coming up in me is just that my whole life, I used to say that I loved the job I did because I loved the formula of the more you put in, the more you get out. And that's what it felt like. I loved the idea that I could put so much more in and I would f seem to get so much more out. But I'm not sure if that was on a material level in terms of like financial or perks or recognition or status or, or whatever it might be. But it also felt a little bit like on performance as well. But it only worked on performance because all the stress and suffering, it just came down to the fact that for that brief period, the passion for what I was doing was stronger than the need to survive it. And therefore, when the whistle went on the field, the passion took over. But I equated that all the stress led to the led to the now of the passion. And that mind-based formula equation sort of fundamental of this plus this will equal this had had me going from trophy to trophy to house to house to, to car and then I'm thinking and then from injury to come back from injury to come back and eventually the idea came as like Christ, Christ it's not there it's not there so there is what's it adding up to and then suddenly I got the deathbed picture of retirement and thinking well what's waiting for me in retirement that's not here already and then I sort of thought oh this is such a big opportunity to to stop and 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 try and see through this intellectual kind of logic of the payoff is coming. But as a result, unfortunately, I had another one in me which was built by this kind of different definition of being of service to everyone, which was like, I'm going to leave my mark and my legacy after I'm gone. The legacy. So now, so now there's no beating no, the, the equation legacy. because it's oh, got yes. me after, it's got me in the grave still trying to trying to arrive <laughs> still trying whilst I'm not even here and and I think you know I think it's so powerful for me because I guess that was my exhaustion but it was also it was also slightly depressing for me to look ahead and think this is what it's going to look like this is the cycle this is you and I'm going to wind this and wind it and I'm going to have some ups I'm going to have some downs I'm going to have some ups and I had to ask myself is this enough is this going to be enough? Is it enough now? No. Well, why is it mm. going to be enough when you've exhausted it for another 20 years? And the only thing I'll have is the fact that, okay, physically, I might not be able to do as much. So you're going to have to wipe out half of that. Mentally, I might start losing that capacity. So I have to wipe, wipe out half of that side of it. And so you do come up with the same argument that life gets harder as you get older, according to that formula. And I, I didn't, I just didn't. And still, part of me now just, yeah, I'm just like that's not it. That's not that's not a life I'm I'm going to live. But it's so easy for those moments for you to sort of. I used to say I'm going to really start meditating when I'm 30. It got to th it got to 35, and I'm like, when I'm 40, it had to be you know like, when do you do it? When do you stop? But then you realise that you can't use the the more I put in, the more I get out necessarily. There's a different one. I'm interested to see your yeah your thoughts and go. If it's not more I put in, more I get out. Where is it? Yeah, that's that. That's you've you've put words to something that I yeah. That's that's totally what I felt by then. It was like come, it was like come on. I'm like 
24 hours a day, I'm bloody doing spiritual practice. And I'm, I am like the good, I'm like the best spiritual student. Where's my effing stuff? Like, where is my prize? Where is my enlightenment? And there was, I, I think there was, there was actually like a frustration. There was like an anger. There was like a rage on, underneath it all. Like I've put in, I put in, I had put in years and years of reading the most boring, bloody spiritual books. I look back and they're so boring. Oh my God, they're so dead and boring. You know, not to judge them, but they were, you know, you, you read what you need to read at the time. But, you know, there, it was like, I put in so much effort. Where was my stuff? Like, where was this thing that I'd been promised? This, you know, I... Oh, that's good. My mind's gone completely blank. That's, that's probably a good sign, Johnny. Because <laughs> <laughs> that leads into, actually, that kind of leads into the next bit. Yeah, so we were talking about this this exhaustion. The escape, yeah, and the, and the escape, escape idea and yeah. the exhaustion, yeah. So we've got stage one and two going from the idea of escape to the idea of exhaustion yeah. and just putting those two together, I guess, to sort of say, well, hold on. Now I've tried everything and I'm knackered. Yeah. And now I've gone to the boundaries of that. Exactly. Yeah, I tried the material stuff and, now I'm, and I got knackered. And then I tried the spiritual stuff and now I'm even double, I'm double, <laughs> double knackered. Worry. I'm like spiritually knackered. <laughs> That's a good title for this podcast, Spirit, <laughs> Spiritually Knackered. I am a spiritually knackered, perfect. Yeah. The spiritual knacker yard. But I think, but this, this is the thing, like, we're all seekers deep down. I mean, I, 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 I thought I was so special because I was a spiritual seeker looking for enlightenment. Actually, I look back, I was no different from, you know, anyone else really. We're all, we're all, we're all doing that, that, that same mechanism, looking for happiness outside ourselves, looking for peace, looking for love, looking for oneness outside of ourselves we're all doing it in a million different ways you know so searching for spiritual enlightenment it's just one version of, of, of it's the same it's the same game you know you want you want you know the, the next iphone or a nice shiny new car or you want the nice shiny new enlightenment you know and i there's not much difference really and that's really that was really hard to swallow when i started to realize that so yeah i i was left in this state i was i was spiritually knackered double knackered frustrated, fed up, sick. I was at this point, I was kind of sick to death with all the spiritual jargon. You know, all the all the Sanskrit words and the fancy, you know, and the, I was just tired. I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to go home. I just wanted home, you know. So it was in, it was in the midst of this, this exhaustion. I tried everything, nothing worked. You know, I, I, I just thought it's, I, I'm never going to get there. I'm never going to get there. Never going to, it's never going to happen. And then one day, one very, very ordinary day, and it was when I was doing nothing. This is the irony of it. I was just sitting around exhausted. I think I was in my bedroom. I was in, living in Manchester at the time. Fed up, you know, lost. More lost than I'd ever been in my life, actually. Now, like, spiritually lost. Hmm. And I, I looked over at a, um, a chair. And so here's the thing, nothing... Nothing happened. So when I tell this story, it sounds like there was, some, this, there was this big like bolt of something. Ha Nothing happened. This is the thing. This is the hardest thing to kind of put into words. I, I looked at a chair and there was just this, this moment of just simple understanding. Just on a, on a soul level, on a heart level, on this kind of, it was the sense of, oh, 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 it, it's always been here. That this thing that I was I've been looking for my whole life actually it's always been here I, I wouldn't it wasn't this new piece of information that came along I, it was more like this remembering it was it, it felt like remembering something I had always 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 known that the the miracle is right here in the ordinariness of life it was it was there in a I call, call it the miracle, call it God, call it the divine, call it oneness, call it wholeness, call it enlightenment. It doesn't really matter because in the end, I, what I realized was these were all just words. They were all just thoughts, all of them, even the, the fancy refined spiritual thoughts. I am, I am pure awareness. I am this. I am pure consciousness. I, well, even that was just, that was so much less than what this was. It was, it was God. I mean, we could use the word God. For me, God is just a word that points to the the ineffable mystery of creation of, of of existence. The before language, but the thing is, we have to use language because well, because we're doing a <laughs> podcast, so we have to say say things. But this was this was this recognition. It, it came before words. It was like in that moment, it 
it felt like the whole thing just crumbled. The whole spiritual search just fell away. And it, yeah. or, or more, or rather, it was kind of seen through. It was, it was like seen to be this, like, what, what have I been looking for my whole life? It's always been here. It was, it's right there in that bloody chair. The last place that I would ever, ever look for it because I was looking with my mind. I was looking in time. I was looking for it. It's like Jesus says in the Gospel of Thomas. He said that the, the kingdom of heaven is spread out over the earth, but men and women do not see it. Like it's already here, but we don't see it. It's not this other place, this other thing, this other state, this other experience. That, that's what I've been looking for as a spiritual seeker was this special experience. This was the most ordinary of ordinary, like shockingly ordinary. It was just a chair. It wasn't even some special seeing, because that's what I've been trying to do is I have to see the chair in a special way. It was just a chair. And, and I, I, I remember at this point, I, I, was, I started to cry, but just with this kind of recognition, this remembering that I, oh, I'm like, I'm here and it's here. Like I, home is here in some yeah. ineffable way that I couldn't, I couldn't understand. It's, it's not like I understood any of this with the mind. It was just this simple knowing. And then I, lo- I remember looking around the room couldn't quite believe what I was seeing. It was, it was the chair. It was the carpet. I became fascinated with the carpet. <laughs> oh shit! Oh shit! It's also the carpet. It was in the ordinariness and and the 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 imperfection. It was in the imperfection of ordinary life. It wasn't this exalted spiritual state. It was there in the peeling wallpaper. You see, it was in the damp patch in the corner of the room. It was in my my toenail that had grown a bit too long. It was. It was right here. Like I, it was the last place that I had ever thought to look was right here. Was presence the, the last place that I would would ever think to look? The way I would say it now, it was just I became present. You know, like present for the first time in my life. I think not that even I became present because you can't really become present. It was almost this this remembering that what I am, what I have always been, is that thing that I'm longing for. It's not, it's not that I became, because that's what I've been trying to do was become something else. First of all, some worldly successful thing. And then I was trying to become some spiritually successful thing, some enlightened thing. And this kind of, it felt like this came before all of that. It was like, oh, like I'm already whole. And in some ineffable, mysterious way, I am what that chair is. I don't need to understand it. I don't need to have any words for it. I don't need, all the words come after, all the, all the fluffy, spiritual, poetic words come, come after. And what I realized as well is this is true for all of us. This is not some special experience that I'm having. This is some fundamental universal truth that what I am is what the chair is, is what the carpet is, is what the peeling wallpaper is, is what you are, is what you are and you are. And again, words words come afterwards, but this this wholeness, this oneness, this consciousness, this presence, it's all it's always already here. You when you look for it, you miss it. It's not in time. It's not going to happen to you. And this is then this is what blew my mind in a, in a way was that <laughs> so to speak, was that for so many years I'd been trying to have some special experience, some special spiritual experience. And what I realized, this is not, this is different from all those, all those orgasmic intense, this is spiritual experience. This is very quiet and ordinary. It's almost like nothing. It's very undramatic, you know? Oh shit, God is a chair. Oh. So that, that, that was, that was the beginning of the end, really the end of my spiritual seeking that and I had other experiences non-experiences like this over the next few months but this once I really saw the chair like really saw the chair I couldn't quite believe anymore in all that spiritual stuff about becoming enlightened or like entering some other state or it was the ordinary I I started to fall in love this this was the beginning of me falling in falling in love with 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 the the ordinariness of of life falling in love with presence falling in love with the the broken things and the imperfections, falling in love with, and then this is what happened as well. I, with I was like, oh shit, there's this body, there's this body. I have this body that for so many years I've been trying to perfect, or I've been trying to transcend. I've been trying to escape, you know. And I I, I remember like, <laughs> you know how like little babies they just kind of they're just like fascinated with their hands, because they they get it. 
they know they haven't been conditioned out of this stuff. They haven't been taught to hate themselves. They haven't been taught to run from experience yet. You know, the the, the divine, it, it's in our hands, you know, and I, I just found myself, I became fascinated with, oh, it's, it's in the simplicity. It's in the ordinariness. It's it's in this this imperfect body. It's in the flab and the scars and the and the pimples and the like. Oh, I had this idea I, I, maybe my whole life that I like I somehow I had to become perfect before I would be worthy worthy of love or worthy of bloody enlightenment. I thought it was about perfecting myself, and so many spiritual teachers bless them. That's kind of how they made it sound like they were in some perfect state you know, that they were in some, maybe they were saying this or maybe it's how I interpreted it, but that's kind of how it sounded. But like they were, they were in some other state, some perfect state where they, they never feel fear and they never feel pain and they, they always have nice, fluffy, positive thoughts. And I, I, I bought into that. What I realized in, in this chair experience, non-experience, it was that was just all bullshit. It was just all bullshit, all of it, really. That this, this oneness, is, it's all inclusive. It includes the body. It includes our, our imperfections. It includes our loneliness. It includes our, our anxiety, our fear, our, our broken hearts. It includes our doubts. For so many years, I'd been trying to eradicate my doubts. Because you know, I thought that's what enlightenment was, was a state where, of no doubts. You know, And some spiritual teachers were saying that. Once you become enlightened, or blah, 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 all doubts will disappear. All fear will disappear. And what I realized was this, this is all just the, this is all just a fantasy. This is the mind's version of enlightenment. This is this is actually quite violent. It felt started to feel quite violent. What have I been doing? What's wrong with doubt? This this is the question I started to ask myself. Was like it's like oh shit, what's wrong with doubt? What's what's wrong with being sad? What's wrong with my imperfections? Something in my brain just switched because it's all that made of the same stuff. Like it's the it's my, if God is in the chair or oneness or whatever you want to call it, it's in the chair, it's in the peeling wallpaper, it's in the dog shit in the street. But then it's also here in my doubt. It's also here in the, in the parts of myself that I'd previously felt shame around or rejected or I'd been taught that anger was bad or sadness was, was, sadness was weakness or, or, the, or the, yeah, the spiritual teacher is telling me that I, I shouldn't have doubts, that doubts are a sign of ego. Or if you doubts are a sign that you still have a separate self. It's been worded in so many different ways. But this message had come from the world, and it had come from, you know, a lot of spiritual teachers, was that my imperfect, vulnerable, shaky, sweaty, awkward humanity somehow wasn't okay. And this just smashed it all. This just smashed it. It was like, oh. So now, now the path became, it was no longer about looking for enlightenment or trying to get there. It was all, now it was about, now I was fascinated, curious, what's it like to be here? And that changed everything. What's it like to be here? I really, I mean, it's really, really powerful. I've, I've not heard it explained or explored in that way, in your way. And I think it's, uh, yeah, I really love it. I, I think looking at it from a perspective of, those imperfections, those doubts and everything. One of the things that was so key and is so key to that kind of mind understanding of the superhuman, and I want to look at that just in a little bit, just with regard to human potential and what we think human potential is through the mind versus what we're exploring, I think, a bit more here. But through that mind version of getting there, the relationship with thoughts and feelings that we have is that these aren't according to that other state that I'm after whether it's you know, whatever it be you know like we do it in sport you look at people on the sports field and you're kind of thinking oh that person's a machine you know I want to be like that they're machine look at them they're so calm under pressure so you think okay in order to be like that I'm I must be without doubt I must be machine like as in sport or in the spiritual side of the peace and the and the the openness and the the lovingness and everything you think that those feelings that you have and those thoughts are not of the path they are a wrong turn some way so how do I for me for example spending your life fighting and trying to resolve or trying to get rid of or understand all these things which plays 
as the Einstein quote, I think something along the lines of, yeah, the, the same energy or mind that creates the problem you're trying to solve it with. So you're just locking into that cycle that keeps those alive. I talk about sort of feeding fear with reassurance creates an even stronger fear machine because it's just got to, it's just, you're basically just helping it grow. You're giving it what it wants. So it comes back and says, I need more of that now. I'm wondering, looking at this, what's that relationship now with thoughts and feelings? You're talking about, yeah, what's wrong with them? But if a immediate sense is, I have this feeling, like you and I were discussing around childhood, anxiety, depression, and this is not the life I want to live. And the immediate thought then is, well, I want to be more happy. I want happy thoughts, but I have these ones. There's obviously a lot in the therapy kind of psychology or, or meditation angle, but what's the what's the other route towards that shift in perceiving or even just relationship with those feelings in the in the allowing i know a lot of your your work and your books around allowing acceptance and the rest and the peace and the meditation is so so powerful but i'd be interested to, you know what what's that relationship with those feelings now you know for example with that pang of anxiety that comes what's the new operational kind of uh, manual say now that you're in that space no, it's, a, it's a great question. I think it's the, maybe it's it's the question. So, yeah. So, so just going back to my story for a little bit. After after I had this this chair, what should we call it? This chair awakening. After 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 the the chair the chair moment. Yeah. What what I realized on a very very deep deep like fundamental level was that there was nothing wrong with me. And every thought, every sensation, every feeling, however intense, however negative, however painful, however unwanted, is on some deeper level, maybe in a way I can't even put into words, it's on some deeper level, it's, it's, it's divine, like it's okay. I think that's where we have to begin. It's like, and of course, it's, it's totally understandable and natural and human to, to not want to experience certain feeling states. You know, when, when we're in pain, physical or emotional pain like of, of of course it's the most natural thing to not to not want the pain it's not comfortable when there's fear when there's anger when there's grief mm. you know physical pain of course there's a part of us that just doesn't want it to be there and we we want it to go away the danger we're talking about acceptance actually the danger we're talking about anything is that the mind will make it into this okay this is the new goal right Oh, I get it now from Jeff's story. Jeff and Johnny are talking. Okay, I get it. Like, acceptance is the thing. I have to. Ex I have to accept <laughs> all my thoughts and all my feelings, and and that's the way to get there. You know, the mind loves its dogmas. The mind loves its its dogmas. So, and I get it as well. I mean, when you know, after I had the chair experience, and I you know, I remembered the oneness prior to all manifestation, and remembered who I truly was. Blah blah blah. I honestly thought I would never forget that ever again. I thought, I, oh, I get it now. This is it. Like, I've got it now. I've had the chair thing. I've had the chair thing and this is the end. And, and, but no, in a way that was just the beginning, you know, like awakening or whatever you want to call that. I, I don't even, I don't even know what to call it anymore. Spiritual awake. I don't know what to bloody call anything anymore. In a way that was just, that was just the beginning. Now I knew on, on the deepest level, I knew that somehow it was all about accepting myself, allowing myself, allowing myself to be afraid. When anger came, when when sorrow came, allowing those feelings, when allowing thoughts, and this of course is the basis of meditation. You know, there's this. Uh, so I'm going off on like a million different tangents here, but maybe it will all come back to the same place somehow. <laughs> this is what's so wonderful about meditation. You know, that I mean, like true true meditation. I mean, what I would say is true meditation, which is just really just about being present, just sitting, doing nothing, being present, and just having this stance of kind of open, receptive curiosity, just kind of watching, watching existence, watching the rise and fall of existence, watching thoughts come and go, because they do. And of course, what you start to notice if you've ever meditated for more than a few minutes is that you, we have no control, really. We have no control over the next bloody thought. We, we can't control those clouds in the sky. We can't control those waves in the ocean. We, we, this is a, a meditation is a massive blow for the ego massive blow for the ego which is why the ego doesn't want to meditate resist meditation it calls it says meditation is boring and in a way what meditation is it's boring it's meant to bore you to death what you're really doing is you're breaking you're breaking the addiction of a lifetime you're breaking your addiction of a lifetime which is the addiction to the next moment the addiction to 
having some other experience than the one you're having. It, of course, it's boring. We it's like we go into with when we're meditating properly. It's like we're going into withdrawal. Wow. Yeah. You know. That's huge. It's the most boring thing. Yeah. It's like it's like just watching thoughts coming and going, just watching sensations coming and going in the body. Oh, there's some sadness here. Okay. And doing nothing with it. For 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 some of us, that's like that's like just a radical radical suggestion is to do nothing. We're so, especially in our culture, we are so <laughs> programmed, conditioned to do something, do something, do something. And meditation kind of, it's just this invitation, this gentle invitation. Okay, I know there's a part of you that wants to do something right now, want, that wants to, like you said, wants to get rid of this thought, wants to stop this thought, wants to attack this thought, wants to erase this thought, wants to silence the mind. But what would happen if just for a moment you you allowed? It's like trying to silence waves in the ocean. We you can't. They're, they're too powerful. So, but what if we just allowed? You know, a, allowed the, these thoughts to come and go and feelings. You know, what if we just? Anyway, so 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 this has been my this has been my journey over the past 10, 15 years now. Is is just learning 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 how to love myself really on the deepest level Learn, learning and when i say love myself i mean what i mean is learning to love my thoughts even you know even when they're negative thoughts or dark thoughts or or, or critical thoughts not trying to stop them or control them but just noticing that the, these are all the possible waves that can ar- arise in the ocean that i am you know l- learning to allow myself to feel sad you know, I, I was someone who, and maybe you can relate, you know, in growing up in my family, no one expressed sadness. I never saw my dad cry. I never saw my mom cry, really. I, I had so much sadness in me when I was a child, but there was no one there to see it. No one validated it, you know. So I just learned, okay, sadness doesn't have a place, so I pushed it away. Anger, I wasn't allowed to be angry, so I pushed it away. And so, you know, after, after this awakening, I started to become fascinated with what, well, okay, all this stuff that I've pushed away, like, can I, can I, and this has been my journey the past 15 years, the, turn, the sense of kind of turning towards all of this, this pushed away material, all, all of turning to, turning back towards myself. Sometimes I talk about thoughts and feelings as, as they're like your children, you know, they're, they're like lost children and they just want a home in you. I think that the Buddha talked about the, the middle way, you know, it's like when, just for example, when when a wave of sadness arises in you, so it's helpful sometimes to see just feelings, thoughts and feelings as like waves in the ocean. We have to begin by just giving ourselves what, what we never got as children, which is just validation. Okay, there's there's sadness here. You know, we, we have to come out of denial. We can't, we have to face the truth of our experience. If there's sadness here, Let's turn towards it and validate it and acknowledge it. Let's begin anyway by bowing to our experience, even if it's scary, even if it's uncomfortable, even if your mind starts saying, oh, you know, this sadness shouldn't be here. Or, you know, or there's something wrong with me for feeling this. This is all this is all the conditioning. The mind might say, you know, yeah, there's there's something wrong with me. I'm I'm too weak. I'm blah, blah, blah. Or just just different versions of, you know, this shouldn't be here. Or maybe if you have spiritual programming, oh, well, if I was enlightened, that's what I always used to do to myself. If I was in this other this other state, which doesn't, doesn't exist, by the way, I've met some of the most en- seemingly enlightened people on this planet. And behind the scenes, when you get to know them, they, all of them, every single one, they all have doubts. They all have fears. They all, you know, have have anger, all of them. You know, wh- wh- however they present to the world, I know I've met some of the 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 you know the A list most enlightened, most this, most that. Bless the, bless us, bless them, bless us. We're all so deeply human underneath the mask, and the spiritual mask can be just as much of a mask as, as, as you know the the perfect, the perfect person. It doesn't exist. But bless us, bless us all. You know we are all so deeply human, and we're, we're all so deeply vulnerable, and we all have doubts. And we all have fears, and sometimes we don't know what we're doing, and and, and we all, you know, feel lonely sometimes. We, we we feel afraid sometimes. And this is, when did this become a mistake or something that we have to fight or transcend or, you know, for me, like you know, some uh, so many times in my life, I've 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 been humbled. I've been humbled, you know. I, I've 
<laughs> so many times in my life, you know, like you're going along, you, you think you have the answers, you think that you're, you know, you th- you think you you think you've got things sorted, you think your life's going well, you think you have the answers, you think, and then life just comes and kind of knocks you. It just kind of it, it, it's suddenly out of the blue, like a loss, something very precious to you, you you lose a, a heartbreak, a relationship shatters or. Your health suddenly, you know, this is what happened to me a couple of years ago. Suddenly your, your health just deteriorates out, like out of the blue, without warning, very often, without any warning. And and suddenly, you know, again, all of your cleverness, all of your answers, all your expertise is just like, you know, it, it doesn't matter if, if you sweep the floors or you're like the world's greatest spiritual teacher, you know, you're like, you're like the Buddha himself, herself doesn't matter you know that in that moment your heart is broken you feel lost you feel vulnerable all it all just shatters the whole thing you and life will humble us it will it, it, it will humble us and that's not a mistake you know and and, and the, so quickly we go into our minds like I've done something wrong what's wrong with me but maybe this is just a, a deeper, another invitation, a deeper invitation to turn towards yourself. Maybe this heartbreak wants to be felt. Maybe there's intelligence in it. Maybe this doubt, maybe this loneliness, may, maybe these, you know, something, this is not something that's gone horribly wrong in your life. You know, maybe this is an invitation. This is what happened to me, you know, a couple of years ago. I, this, this, this Lyme disease, this, you know, it just knocked me it, it it just you know i i and and again it was humbling I, I i thought you know well i'm jeff foster the spiritual teacher i've got all these books blah 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 i didn't really think that but <laughs> <laughs> but maybe there was some of that there and, th- and then suddenly i find myself with all these like horrific symptoms and and i i had my energy i had no i could barely get out of bed most days my nervous system was just because it was affecting my brain and the, the bacteria got into my brain just these horrific symptoms, aches and pains all over my body. And like, honestly, in the midst of that, it was the sense of, I write books about acceptance. I write books about acceptance. And, and actually in, in those moments, honestly, I felt a million fucking miles away from acceptance. One million miles away. I, what, was, what was true in my experience was actually, I don't want this. This is, this is hell. It, it was really hellish. What was interesting was just noticing my my mind. My mind was telling me, "Come on, Jeff! Like you, you should you should be doing better than this, you know? Like you're Jeff Foster. You should be. You write books on this stuff. You you should be. You should just be present with it and just gracefully allow it and blah 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 blah." But what I noticed, no, the mind has turned the mind has turned that into a should. It's incredible. It's just incredible. The the infinite ways in which the mind can punish us and make us wrong, and I actually. What was actually true in my experience was there was there was non acceptance, there was non acceptance. So then, of course, the invitation is like, can we, can we even bring some acceptance to our non acceptance? You know, can can we bring some, can we turn towards even our our resistance, our, our non acceptance? Maybe, maybe even that is not a mistake. Maybe even our non acceptance, our resistance, that part of us that doesn't want to be where we are, that wants to run away, that that wants to be somewhere else. Maybe even that part, it's just like a it's just like a child. You know, it's if we could see even that part as just a child. Like I, I always think of Jesus on the on the cross. I think it's such a powerful such a, such a powerful myth. You know, and I and I think of the moment where Jesus, uh, you know, when he's he's on the cross and he's uh and th- and this is this is like God, this is like God himself. And he's, and he's, you know, in the midst of this, the, the pain, the torture of being crucified. I mean, there isn't, that, that's, that is, that's torture, you know, crucifixion on a, on a, on every level, physical, physically, emotionally, spiritually, he's being tested on, on, on every level, you know, he's lost everything. He's lost his livelihood. He's lost his, 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 his friends. He has to say goodbye to his, his, his friends, his family, his, in that moment, he he cry, he cries out. He cries out like you know, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? In that moment, even even Jesus is full of doubt, full, 
of profound, profound doubt. In that moment, he forgets all of his wisdom, all of his spirituality. He doubts God. He doubts Call it God, call it consciousness, call it presence, call it truth, whatever. It's it's like his whole teaching, everything is in doubt. And he and, and, and we all have moments like this. We all have moments like this. And I, you know, I I I'm not comparing myself to Jesus at all, but we all have I mean Jesus is just us. He's just us, you know. We and we all have moments like that in the midst of heartbreak, loss, pain, when life doesn't go our way, when the external world kind of shatters and everything seems out of control and just just to say that you know even god doubts so let let's let's be a bit more um forgiving of ourselves yes it's about accepting yeah accepting ourselves and loving ourselves but also there's some moments where we just feel a million fucking miles away from self love we feel a million miles away from god whatever our god is we feel a million miles away from enlightenment we feel a million miles away from from i am you know that's what jesus is saying is is i am where are you he's forgotten who he is that's courage is to keep going courage is not courage we're talking about courage like real strength real power real courage is for me anyway. This is why I would say it's it's not the absence of doubt. It's not it's not getting into the state where there's no doubt and no fear and no heartbreak, and where there's absolute certainty. That's 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 not real courage. Courage is when you are you're in pain and you're full of doubt and you feel lost and you you don't even know what your next step is sometimes. But but you show up and you keep walking. Even though you, sometimes you don't even know where you're going. You don't, you don't even know if the next step will take you to death. You don't know. But that's real courage. Courage is when you are, you are fully present. You're present. You're there. You're present with your doubt, with your fear, with your, the, this, this wonderful, shaky, awkward, imperfect human self. It, it comes along. It's, it's, it's included. And for me, that's wholeness. That is wholeness, is that radical inclusion. It's not the, this perfect state It's showing up, showing up, taking each step with your imperfections, with your doubts. So in that moment, you have doubts, but they don't control you. You have fears, but they don't control you. You have a shaky, broken heart, but I'm here. I I am here. And for me, that's where the human and the the divine are one, like non-duality and duality. It's all... The, the sacred and the profane, the, the the God and man, God and woman, it's all just one, it's 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 one thing, you know? It's not, when this is not about getting rid of doubts, getting rid of fears and being in this perfect state of like pure awareness, pure purity, this, this, this idea of we have to become pure. I don't want to be pure. I don't want to be pure. Pure ideas. Of, that's what leads to genocide, inter, external and in, internal genocide. I don't want internal. I, I want to be here with my impurities, with with my doubts and my weirdness and my shakiness and my fears. And and, and I that for me, that's what being present is really about. It's not. It's not. We sometimes. Sorry, I, I, will, I will finish. But I haven't done a podcast in two years, so it's, it's all like verbal. Let's get everything in. I've got two years worth of stuff, Johnny. Get them all in. Get them all in. It's <laughs> 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 brilliant. Do you know what? It, it is. It is throwing so much, so much out there, which which is so powerful for me. For example, perfectionism, purity. There's no, there's, there's, there's no, which is all, you know, the idea based stuff, stuff you gather from conditioning around you. The way that I look at the way that I might be with my family every now and again, if someone has a bit of an issue, they're not feeling good. I'm so sort of compassionate yet. I'm trying to fix it. I'm trying to fix it. I'm not always very good at validating that it's okay to be sad because you're like, but I know you want to be happy. So, you know, let's get there. But it's a case of saying, but how can you actually have happiness without fully embracing the sadness and and I think but mm. that that mind based idea of purity and perf- and and perfection and and that this is the other thing you were talking about you know the other state and this is how to get there and this is what it looks like and all this kind of stuff it, it means that how can you have awareness it will be it will be usurped constantly by analysis like in meditation oh, I've had this thought oh well hold on 
am I having a spiritual experience? Is this a good one? Where's this <laughs> yeah. coming from? Where's it going to take me? Oh, no, wait, I've stopped exactly. having it. I've stopped having it, you know. Yeah, and yeah, I, I, yeah, think, yeah. I think looking at that as well in terms of a human potential perspective, driven by those same ideals, the way that we look at human potential immediately, people might tune in because you're thinking, well, how do I run faster? Yeah, how do we jump high in my sport? Human potential was nothing to do with health and balance. It was to do with fitness and pushing yourself to the edge on a physical level. Like you said, do, 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 do. Nothing to do with exploring the being. But you know fully well that a player, when they go on the field, if they are at one with their being and comfortable and, and within that space of the unknown, happy to be in a space of awareness and not constant analysis, you have flow and you have that absolute kind of expression. And even in the absolute flow and expression, someone can say, geez, I was in the zone then. You might look at them and say, well, I didn't see you doing anything superhuman. It's like, but that's not what the zone or the flow is. It's just, it's just that sort of slight, I don't know, branching towards oneness where you feel a little bit more inclusive of everything instead of trying to work it all out formulaically you have a sense of feeling understanding it like you said in that kind of inarticulable way of of just of just knowing it and not being able to talk about it but looking at this question therefore about human potential with i love the idea about and it's such a powerful so so powerful this idea that we're not going to necessarily stop having doubts and fears and hurt and what have you because we're also not going to stop having dreams and desires but also if we did what on earth of life experience would that be when you reach there who would want to reach enlightenment if when you got there that was it mm. that part of and, and I think that so for me in, in that respect looking at two things I'm going to throw at you at the same time one is that human potential of like so what how do we frame human potential for people that might be sort of looking at it as a space of kind of what well, I want to live longer I want to be able to move my body more fluidly and more relaxedly and more be looser and more flexible I want to I want to love more and and you know all these kind of things that, yeah there's there's so much great intention in there but some of the stuff is it, most of it being so much driven towards that idea of that utopian kind of idyllic but also superhuman superhero-esque view of of life and then how does that translate to how we're seeing the potential of the planet through the same eyes in the way that we're taking control almost of where the planet needs to be we can see where it's heading and how that might relate to human survival on it but we're also there creating the same idea of what human potential might be in that enlightened state but we're also looking at a planet in terms of saying well this is an ideal planet what is it how does it all mix to say and what is the in another words i guess what is the what does the future look like in 150 500 years whatever it might need to be when if there has been a shift towards what we're talking about your experience of awareness because immediately you sort of think oh well everyone's super healthy everyone looks really young everyone's living super long the planet is just just green and lush and everyone gets on but then you're kind of like saying but hold on is that really what we're looking at here is that going to solve anything or is that going to create a load of comfort and lack of challenge lack of growth lack of evolution so what is it you know, everyone sort of sh this shift that people talk about needing to take place in awareness yeah, what's what is that doing for human potential? How do we see human potential before through that? And also, will it, you know, will things in five hundred years time be that much different if we're still on Earth with our desires, with everyone with their individual desires and dreams, mm. still facing challenges? Mm. I don't know. <laughs> That's the shortest answer you give. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> I gave the long one. You gave the short one. I I. I... I mean that's always that's, that's always where I begin is I don't I don't I don't yeah. I don't know I don't know I, I just as you were talking I was I was listening to you but I was also thinking what a strange thing it is to be a human being you know we we human beings it's like we live we live in two it's almost like we live in two realities at once you know on one hand 
we live in our memories of the past. We can we can sit here and we can talk about what happened yesterday and years gone by, our childhoods, or we can we can sit here and we can think and imagine and dream and hope and plan for the future tomorrow, you know, what we're having for dinner this evening or some project that we're gonna create. We can we can imagine what life will be like five, ten, fifteen, twenty, a hundred thousand years from now. You know, and so in uh, in one sense we we live in we live in time, the world of the mind, the the world of time. But at the very same time, and it's almost like this is an, another reality that, that when I just stop in any moment and and just look, all I find what I find is my my bum, my bum on this yellow sofa. I I feel some warmth on my legs. I'm wearing shorts. I can hear the sound of by the river. I can hear the sound of a boat going past. I can feel my heart beating. I, the, the, when I really stop and take a look, there's just this moment. No other creature on the planet, no other, no other animal, seems to have to face this. This, or it's some, sometimes it seems like almost like an absurd situation of. of also, by the way, being being aware, you know, uh, w- because we have these minds as human, we're, we're aware of our own mortality. We can we can think about our own deaths. We, we we can sit here and think and even worry about the future. We we can think about well, you know, we, we can think about our deaths in twenty, thirty, forty years time. Or, or I can imagine, oh my God, well, what about tomorrow? Something bad could happen to me or my loved ones tomorrow. And this is the blessing and the curse of having of having a mind. We can. These minds, that I mean, they're, they're such incredible tools. I mean, on one hand, look what humanity has done. We've we've gone to the moon. We've we've found cures for the seemingly incurable diseases. These buildings that we build, they're, they're astonishing, astonishing feats of engineering and technology and medicine. And at the same, this is the same mind that that builds gas chambers and concentration camps and plans m- murders and and we all have this mind, you know, and and. So what? So so it just it was just struck me that just to be a human being, just to exist right now as a human being, it's a very it's a very strange thing. Spend any time with an animal, with a cat, with a dog, or with a with a, a very you know with a, a baby. All there is for them is is the present moment. You know, you just spend some time with a cat. My 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 cat was one of my greatest spiritual teachers. You know, I twenty years ago I was there. So, <laughs> I was there reading for hours and hours these books with the titles like I am that and you are that and you are this and you are consciousness and I am awareness itself and there is only this moment you know just head buried my head buried in these very serious books and my cats just kind of talk about something that's really living it living in the present moment here I am reading about the present moment not be not being in the present moment by the way which is quite, quite ironic and my cat was just wandering around she's chasing a butterfly she ate when she was hungry and she played with the grass and then she was tired. She went for a sleep. But, but it, she was so, she wasn't sitting there thinking about, oh, sh- God, shit, I'm going to die in like 10 years. I'm going to die. And like, what's the meaning of my life and the purpose? And oh, God, that thing that, that happened, that, that blah, blah, you know, it's just, it's, animals don't have time for that. They, they, animals have to be aware of their immediate surroundings. They have to be present. It's a survival thing. So I, I was just, it just struck me that just, it's very interesting that because we have that human beings, we we live in the world of the present moment, yes, but we also live in this other, this second world, this other world, the world of the past and of the future, the world of memory, regret, anticipation, fantasy, dreams, and hopes and plans, and that seems to be, you know, we seem to be the only creature on the planet. Who knows? Maybe any bloody planet. Who knows? Who knows? The that exists in this situation, in this, in this, in this comic, absurd, tragic, sometimes unbearable, sometimes exquisitely beautiful ex- experience. You know, we 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 can sit here and hope and dream and plan and and have visions, and at the same time, we're just you know bum on chair, breath going in and out. The warmth on the face. When I really, really stop and look, there is, I can't find anything but this moment. I cannot find anything but pure presence. And in this pure presence, the past doesn't exist. The future doesn't exist. Or rather, 
the past does exist, but but only as a a memory, an image in the mind, maybe voices in the head, pictures in the mind, appearing in this presence, in this moment. So the past, when I really t- stop and take a kind of ruthlessly honest look at my experience, mm. where is the past? It's very trippy when you really start to <laughs> when you really start to look into it. It's very trippy that we. Where is the past? I can't find it. it. It's it's a picture in my mind right now in the present. Where's the future? It's it's pictures, thoughts, images, voices in, in, in my head. Where? In the present. Always in the present. It's like every breath is in the present moment. So so it's very strange. We never actually... I'm, I'm sure this has nothing to do with your question at all. It, 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 it's, it's interesting, though, because some people often say to me, well, two questions I get asked a fair bit. One is, what did it feel like, you know, winning a, a, a the big game that happened sort of s- several years ago? What did that moment feel like? And I find yeah. it difficult because, yes, because you like you said before, you weren't there. In, 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 I, I, in some sense, you weren't there. I, I wasn't there when it happened because it was a. It felt like a bit of a passenger experience, like you said, very much just aware of what's going on, but not really in it, which probably allowed it to sort of happen the way it did. But at the same time, also being here now, when I talk about yes. it, yeah. I'm talking fiction. It's it's about, like you said at the beginning, it's someone else. It's another life. I'm just making up a story. And the story, I'm not, I'm not deciding how I'm going to make it. I'm not playing that kind of manipulative role. But it's coming through the way I feel about life now. My memory then finds it's itself. It's like a cat. If you so told the cat the story, the story of your, your World Cup thing, the cat will be like, "What? It's not. It doesn't exist. It's noise. It's yeah. the cat is more interested in the, no. in the in the blade of grass over exactly. there than something that happened in some imaginary ten, twenty, whatever year." Yeah. Years. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. And and the second to bring that to, to point the second. Sorry, I don't want to I don't question. minimize your your achievement. No, 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 you, no, no, not at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> You've just usurped it with a blade of grass. Thanks very much. Um, but the but the, the, the you sort of like actually highlighted exactly the point. The other one is kind of people saying, "Oh, you know what? When did you get into all this spiritual stuff, and how did it happen?" And as exactly as you said at the beginning, I felt like I'm talking about something else. Is they said, "Oh, you know, how long did it take you?" And I'm kind of like, "It's always now. It happened now. It's not a, you. It does even though." along that that sort of maybe more mind level you say oh well here's my process of of how it all kind of fell into place but when you say from an experiential level i've never been anywhere but here and now and there's been no shift like you said because it's always been here so therefore it's only the shift can only take place when it's like well this is where i was and this is where i am now but the shift brings you to the way you are now to realize like you said there's been no shift. it reminds me of of you know my my dad he died a few years ago he had alzheimer's and I, I spent a lot of time with him. I, I, I was his carer for a while. I had some really beautiful, trippy, mind-expanding, heart-opening conversations with him, especially towards the end, you know, because, you know, his, his memory was, was, was completely going. And, oh, it was so... From one perspective, it's, it can sound tragic, you know, but when you, were, when you were really, really, really present with him, there was something joyful in it. You know, like, I have so many stories, but, like... Uh, I remember one day he forgot where the where the toilet was. Well, it's not that he forgot where the toilet was, it's that it's that he didn't have the memory there. Like the toilet never existed. It's not like he forgot it. It's like it never really existed for him. So I'd find him wandering around the house. Going, go, Jack. He was so sweet towards the end, you know, because my dad was before the illness, he was a very, very difficult narcissistic man who had he had all the answers. My dad was a man who had always had he was always right, black and white, all the time. And then this Alzheimer's came along. And it was beautiful because all his answers started to crumble. Like he started to forget his reality, his old reality. He started to f- forget his opinions. <laughs> he started to forget his his rightness, his cleverness, and he he very much became like a like a, like a child. And you know, he's my dad for the first time in his like he was like in his eighties at this point. He would ask me, Jeff, like what what's that? What's that? like? He became curious. My dad was never a man who asked me questions. He always had the answers. And, and now he, it was quite beautiful. It was very healing in a way for our relationship. So I'd find him wandering around the house. He was like, Jeff, where, where did they, some, someone moved the toilet. Like, where did, where did they put the toilet? Like, it's, you know. And I, he actually, at this point, he wasn't suffering. He wasn't suffering because in his mind, 
they had moved the toilet. It wasn't his, nothing was wrong with him. There was never anything wrong with him. It was always, they, they've moved the toilet. And because at this point, I, and this was such a, 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 a teaching for me, it was such a lesson. I really had to be present with it. I really, with someone with Alzheimer's, because they are so present. They, they become your teachers. I would just, I, would, I just met him wherever he was, whatever he was feeling, it was okay. And wh- whatever he said, that even if it seemed on the surface crazy, for me, it was, it's just, it was, it was just, okay, well, that's, that's what he thinks and it's okay, you know? And so I was just, oh, dad, yeah, they, um, let's go and find the toilet together. I didn't say, you know, I didn't say what's wrong with you. And of course they didn't move the toilet. It's in the same, no, what, what, what would be the point in making him feel bad? For something he was so innocent. He was so innocent. It's like he was returning to this state of of innocence. It was actually quite trippy for me in a way because I, I entered into this state of, su- with him, he was such a teacher, such presence that I started to wonder, well, maybe, like, how do I know? Yeah, brilliant. I, I, it's like I fell into this place of not knowing with him and that's where I could really meet him is that we we don't know. I don't know, you don't know. We, we don't know. And that's what, that's what presence really is. And it's, it's like not this want, this glorious not knowing this kind of state of innocence, like the, the kingdom of heaven. So I'd be like, come on, Dad, let's let's go and find the toilet. And we did this like 20 times a day. And of course, he never remembered. It was always the first time. It, for him, it was always the first time. We're talking about presence, like being present and not having like, like his world had fallen away. You know, he was a fairly successful businessman for 40 years. He ran a factory. I think he had, I think he employed like 100 people. It was like a DIY thing that he did. And, and then he he lost it all. But... For 40 years of his life, this was his whole life. This was his life achievement was was a, being a businessman and running a factory and hiring people. And, and this had consumed his life. I mean, my dad, had, he'd been like a workaholic. This was his life. This was his identity. And then he got this Alzheimer's. Oh, I'll never forget. It was it was so sweet. And I think it says so much about the mind and about who we really are. And uh, I was sitting in the kitchen with my mum and my dad. My mum was caring for him at this time. And dad... It was like, he turned to my mum and it was like, Lynn, Lynn, what did, what did I do for a living? <laughs> and I just thought like 40 years of blood, sweat and tears and sleepless nights and unbelievable stress. And the, and the, and the shiny cars and showing off to people and, and money, money, money. And, and it all ended in, what, 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 did, what did I do? Like, he didn't even know. He didn't. And again, like, you could freight there's something tragic for, you could you could put on the tragic lens there's something tragic about that there's something there's a terrible loss but and this is what i had to do to to be with him to take away the tragic lens and just be just be present with the person in front of me with just just be present with who he is now not who he was then because maybe that what that wasn't who he really was maybe that wasn't who he really was just to and also my mum my was so good with him as well. Cause, and again, we, we didn't say, what's wrong with you, Sid? Like, don't you remember? Because that's, that's when we don't understand Alzheimer's, that's what, that's what we tend to do. We want to help them remember, but it doesn't really help. It just makes them feel bad. And my mum just, my mum just very sweetly said, oh, Sid, you, um, you know, you, you ran a factory for, for, for 40 years. And dad was like, I'll never forget. He was like, really? Did I? And he got a little um, piece of paper out. Oh, it was so sweet. I'm going to cry. And he, and he, he, he scribbled down, I, I ran a factory. And he kept it in his pocket. It just shows you how fragile this whole thing is. Our whole identity, you know, and these things that are so important to us. And I don't know. In the end, isn't it, isn't it about, it's about love. It's about being present. It's, it's about who are you? Yeah, who are you now, you know? And, 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 and again, so t- there, there was something... There was something beautiful about just being with dad, this this new dad. I had to like I I had to let go of who he was and that he didn't even remember our past. I had like 40, 40 years of memories and he could like that was all gone. What was left though was present like presence. I was we we get this moment together. We get not and like why it's like someone why do we have to wait until they, they get sick? They why do we have to wait until they get Alzheimer's to just to remember that actually this is all we get. This is all we get. We get today. We we get we get another day with our loved one. We might not have tomorrow. It really hits home for me because I think whenever you relate to anyone, you see interactions happening on the street between people, they happen in our lives. 
isn't it the case that everything that we've gathered and identified ourselves with from what we've been through, we stick out in front of us and other people do the same and we let those two, let those two sort of avatars, as it were, <laughs> have a crack and we, we, don't, we don't even get involved. <laughs> yeah. And then we talk about, oh, I wish I was in the present moment. But what we're using is past, past avatars to say, you do my business for me because I don't want in. Well, what does it mean to be in? Well, you've got to let go. We're well, not let go, obviously, but you've got to, you've got to in, in a way, remember that you're more than just that small part in order to be able to say that, for example, opinions and, and, and judgments that they lead and that ideas of what I'm going to get out of this meeting leads your meeting for you rather than actually just saying, what is this moment? What is this opportunity? And I was, I absolutely went hell for leather on the fact my passport to safety away from fear and away from the the doom was to was a cv a life cv yeah. and i needed to hand that in to whoever was waiting yeah, at the desk the of, of the pearly the, gates the sacred the holy the holy <laughs> curriculum <laughs> The I think it's the Holy Grail. Oh I think it's the Holy Grail. The, Holy, the Holy, Grail, Holy Grail, the perfect yeah. CV that you hold, you hand in, and 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 you say, "There, that's that's what I did, and who and I." And this became. is who I am. This is and here. This is, who, this is I who I am, and this is what I've done. And, and the same thing. I, I can imagine whoever it is at the the pearly gates or whatever the doorway is to the next three arm, looking at it and being like, "F." Cross. You missed. The, we kind of wanted you to stand in front of us, and we'd have just let you through as who you are. You were, well, this door was always open for you. However, because you're so beautiful, anyway, you yeah, can be because, through. Because you, you tried and you did your CV. best. And yeah. even if you, no, it doesn't <laughs> it matter. Doesn't, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't it matter. Doesn't matter. But, it, but this is this is the, I guess, in a way to to sort of to to wrap it up because, like you said, geez, I could we could we need a part two to this. By the way, we need a part. We, this could, can this be series one. This could Rather be than yes. it be the full, be the full. <laughs> this could be the trailer. Deal. This this is the trailer. This is just the trailer, Johnny. This is the just trailer. the this is just the beginning. Beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. I would watch. I would watch this movie. So a little bit of a as a con conclusion to to the trailer. With regard to trying to balance those two views, then of of kind of this idea that people want to live better, they were not better, but they want to live lives more according to the lives they wish than the ones they don't, with the feelings and what have you. Uh, using if you like and to go against it a little bit what we've just been talking about from memory wise and, and getting you to look at your a past self or an idea of a past self of you what's the difference in the way that you live and see life now compared to when you say for example when you're early 20s with maybe more of the depression the anxiety and everything when you're talking about the fact that you know you still have these moments and these challenges so people might sort of say well well then what's even the point of that shift but what is what's what's the world and and existing and experiencing life mm. now for you if you can relate that to an idea of what it was? I, th I think one of the big differences is I'm more more willing these days to experience discomfort. I think that that's probably is what changed everything for me. Just more willing to take the step to do the thing whatever it is, knowing that taking that step may lead to me having an experience of discomfort. You know, Joseph Campbell said, in the cave you fear to enter lies the treasure you seek. This is true in like all great myths. So there was this, there's like this, this, this tug of war between safety. Like it's like, and I get it, my nervous system was trying to keep me safe. You know, the nervous system, it has one job really, which is just to keep us safe. And one of the ways it tries to do that is, no, no, stay with what you know. It doesn't like the unknown, the new thing. It tells you, no, no, that new thing is is dangerous. It will kill you. It's the dragon. It will bite your head off. And at some point it was like, ah, fuck it. And then, you know, and I, I found I found myself saying, yes, it was very interesting. Like there was, I didn't, I, it was almost like it wasn't me speaking. I, I didn't, I didn't want to, I or the old me didn't want to, do a bloody talk in front of people but some I found it it was like a yes came out you know just nudging myself a little bit into doubt into fear into the scary place you know 
even if there's a uh, that voice in my head screaming, turn back, turn back, it's dangerous, you'll fail. There's more of a sense these days of like, ah, oh, fuck it. So I'll fail. So I'll fucking fail. Let me fail. I will fail. I'll fail gloriously. Let me do it. Let me experience. I think there's more of a willingness these days to just experience, experience. Like, okay, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? Ridicule, shame, failure. Okay. What's that like? I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Because, you know, the alternative is, is death, actually. You know, like, I used to want to die so badly. Yeah. Like, I'd rather be alive. Okay, so life is, life, there's nothing in between. Either, either you're dead or you have a life that includes all of the messy stuff. There's nothing in between. And I don't want the fucking thing in between anyway. It's, it's a half-life. Either I'm fully alive or the other thing, you know. And I, I, I guess that I want to, I want to, these days I want to taste life, even if it hurts sometimes, even if I get my heart broken sometimes, even if sometimes it ends in failure and ridicule. Oh, interesting. What does, oh, I'm experiencing failure right now. What's that? Okay. And then you always find, oh, I've always, it's never as bad as you imagine anyway. What's failure? It's a few, you're only ever facing, you're facing, there's some thoughts running through your head and there's sensations, sensations in your body. That's really it, actually, in any moment. That's it. You're right though, in, in any moment, what is what is there? There isn't. If you if you remove the analysis and the definitions and the understandings, what have you got? Exactly. You've got and and geez, if you want to feel all of life, maybe it's good to feel some of those extreme ones that you that you sort of get away from. But it, but you know, almost disentangling them from the definitions is actually is a, a very present experience. You you mentioned about the. Uh, humiliation whatever what's that you know if i'm going to do it i might as well do it we have a, a thing i have a thing with with a couple of the guys that i coach with when they're kicking balls around is you go through all the the kind of the physical f physics of it and and the forces and how it all lines up then you go yeah you know, then you find this kind of like inner feel based connection that allows you to really commit but to sometimes you need something to get them over the line of just go and and kind of phrases keep coming to mind in that and one of them is that look for god's sake if you're gonna miss just miss beautifully <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you're left with that thing of being like you what do you mean i mean like well you're gonna hit it and if it's gonna miss make sure it's the most amazing miss make sure it's a miss that you're like whoa what a miss and then sure enough you're kind of in that space of being like well actually after that there really is no such thing as missing because even if it doesn't miss, you're kind of like, yeah, but it was impressive. <laughs> it was something. Exactly. Just, just, just like, just like young children, like you know, babies, very young children. When they, they so in the moment when when they're laughing, laughter is is all there is. It's just, they are so in the laughter, and then the next moment, the laughter's gone, and a few seconds later, Wah! and when they're crying, <laughs> it's just one hundred percent, and they don't have a story about it. They do not have a story about it. They don't have a story that the, 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 there's something wrong with them. That's what comes later. They don't have, they're, they're just fully present with, they're fully absorbed. So yeah, exactly. If you're going to miss, if you're going to fail, do it, do it beautifully. Be fully present. It's about the presence. It's not about the thing in the end. That That's the joy, the old, the joy of life. So maybe we come to see it. It's, it's, it's not about the, the the score, whether you win or whether you lose, whether the world loves you or the world thinks you're a blub, whatever. It's it's not about how many books you sell or how many people listen to your podcast or how <laughs> many followers you have on Instagram. It's, it's like, can you just show up for this moment? You know, some of the most beautiful moments in my life have not been the moments when my life has been going well. Some of the most beautiful moments in my life, like, like I think of the moment my dad died. You know, it wasn't life going to plan. It wasn't really what we wanted or expected. But but then you find yourself there. Okay, this is happening. Okay. And, and you know, obviously there's a part of me that wishes it, life was completely different. There's a part of me that wants some other experience. But... I want to. I want to. I want to be here. I. I don't want to miss this moment. I. I even if it hurts, even if it fucking breaks my heart, I want to know it. I want to know this human experience. I want to know what that feels. Yeah, of course we don't want to. We don't want to wallow in that experience or stay there. But just in that, you know, in that moment, like I. I want to know. I want to. I want to be here. I want to. I want to remember this. I want to. I want to. What is, you know, and 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 
And I'm so I'm so grateful because I'd had so many years of kind of feeling, understanding what presence was. The moment my dad died, I feel like, of course, on one hand, you're never ready. You're never ready for a moment like that, a loss, a death, whatever it is, a, a missed goal, like whatever it is, you're never really ready. And there's a part of you that may want something different, but if it just, we can just turn, it's this sense of turning towards our experience, almost like you're kind of an alien on on the earth, experiencing a day for the very first time. You've, you don't know, you have no knowledge. You, you've, you've never experienced something like this before. Like a child, like by Jesus said, you know, like, what's what's it like to be at the bedside of a father who's passing away? Because I only get this once. This is not, this isn't a trailer. This, this isn't a trailer for some future movie, some future event. This is life. So I, I'm so glad that I was able to just fully be there for my dad as he as he passed, as he, you know, fell into the mystery, the most mis- yeah, it's nothing yeah. more mysterious than death. Nothing more mysterious than my birth and death. It's the, just the mystery of life is, the mystery of creation is right there. And just to be fully present for him, with him, as he as he made this transition. And, and, and just to be also interested in what that brought up in me, the gr- deep, deep grief. And then also this joy, like at the same time. It's a big paradox. It's a huge paradox. There's, there was relief at his suffering being over. And there was grief at the the form disappearing it's about i mean this has become such a cliche is you know the pre- be in the present moment the present moment but like it's so it's so true it's it's these moments are so precious this is all you get we we aren't guaranteed a next life no one knows we're not guaranteed another chance at this we're not guaranteed another life we don't know an afterlife, what happens after death? We really don't know. Everything we know is what we've been taught or we've imagined or we've, you know, been been told or we've been... But we really... Maybe, maybe this is all we get. And from one perspective, this is depressing. What? <laughs> this is it? What? It's just... But it's so ordinary. Like for, from the, for the spiritual seeker who was expecting something bigger, more holy, more... So... No, but this... This is the sacred. This is the sacredness. This is sacred. Just sitting in my living room and you, wherever you are, just having a conversation. It's it's it's, it's it might seem ordinary, or walking to the shop, walking to the cafe, and getting a coffee or a, or a nice kombucha. Yeah, <laughs> that was a, that was a plug for me, was it? That was a plug for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the sacredness. It's 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 in the ordinary. It really is, and it's so easy yeah. to forget to lose touch with the present moment and just kind of sleepwalk through our days. And and I'm not judging. Uh, you know, I'm not judging us for doing that. It's we had to learn to numb ourselves. We had to. It's what we learned as kids. But you know, well, I think what we're coming back to what we're talking about is is being fully alive. And, and you can't have the the joy without the sorrow. You can't have the certainty without the doubt. You can't have half of life. This is what non-duality is really about. The deeper meaning of, of non-duality. It's all, all of it. The, the the goal that you score and the goal that, you know, goes completely the wrong direction. It's, it's both. It's life. It's sacred. It's, it's, it's something to... Yeah, like you say, you're going to do it. Do it. Fail beautifully. I'm going to have to say just such a, for a start, a massive thank you. This this seems like, in a way, there's you might say a couple of times, oh, it seems a bit cliche, but geez, having framed it with an hour and a half of such incredible depth, but also that last message, what you're talking about seemed to me is that remove the story, the absolute story in any moment. And what's left mm. is the powerful, like you said, the, the beyond, the, the extraordinary when you remove the story. And I think in a way, if you don't mind me, it, this is an observation is that listening to you speak and having the privilege of being able to watch you on the screen as well as you're speaking you it's it's brilliant there is there's no script you're not you know you, i can't i can't listen to you know an, an old recording you did and be like oh he's telling me that now and oh, i've heard that story and and that's kind of what i mean that is so inspiring is that i feel like almost as if there's no words are coming through you they're not stored. They're not stored in an order. They're coming through you. And 
I think you've sort of said, oh, I know I'm rambling and I'm going over the place, but I'm sort of saying, I, it's not at all. It's, it's, it's completely the opposite because it feels like there's a real respect to the present moment of this and this conversation and being here on the screen and everything. And I kind of, I, I just really, really appreciate it because it, it, it belongs to the, it, to now. It's not, you know, it, those two avatars saying, well, hold on, this is me and versus you, we should get this. It's kind of like, right, go, who speaks first? Well, I better because it's my, it's my <laughs> podcast. So I'll intro, you go. And if you want to go for this and I'll go for it, I'm like, oh, and, and at the end of it, you kind of look back and go, that was exactly what it was meant to be. And I'm, and, and, and I'm, I, I couldn't be happier with it. And, and out of pure respect to you, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of conclude it. And I'm not going to try and review it and think about it. I'm just going to be like, that's no, beautiful. Don't, do not try and review this. We're not, we're, we're it's, <laughs> it's not reviewable. It's unreviewable. <laughs> it was just, but it's been awesome. And, and yeah, gen oh, thank genuinely you, you've taken me on a, on a little bit of a journey. And one of the main things that really comes out of this is that I've, yeah, listening to you speak, I'm still finding this, put this, the big spotlight on my garage in my garage where I thought I cleaned out a lot of the, the, the rubbish. And in the corner, I'm like, oh, there's more. And I've just noticed there's so much more. Wait, are you talking still... about your actual garage? Or is this a metaphor? No, no, that was a metaphor. No, this is a metaphor. Oh, shit, sorry. <laughs> it's a metaphor. <laughs> You're like, not helping me to clean out my garage. <laughs> Oh, you've completely ruined my metaphor now. That's what I do. Oh Johnny, no! I ruined my. Right, anyway, anyway. Johnny, really, uh, honestly. Anyway, like, the point. The point being. Yeah. The point being. Well, listen. The point being is just that where I was going with the garage thing. Incidentally, if you're gonna please let me at least round up the garage metaphor, which was that was that the um, there's still some of me that's that's thinking, when I get this, I'll be there, and whether it's oh when I meet those spiritual absolute a-class spiritual gurus and i get them to put the thumb on my head and i have the vision once i am there to see it for my own eyes then i'll be there and i think just having that opportunity to hear you and just talk about the fact that you know from your own experience too that we're we're all it's it's part of it it's not an escape of it it's so cool so may listen i just wanted to say a massive massive thank you for a roller coaster couple of hours and uh it's been a privilege so if this is the first one for a couple of years I, I hope you do some some more afterwards and take some other people on that journey too oh thank you johnny so that's it for another episode of i am it's brilliant to be sharing this unfolding experience with you all if you'd like to get in touch with either me or the guest then all the information you need is in the show notes I welcome all and any feedback. I really want all of you to have a hand in guiding the feel of this show and the path of the conversation as well. So just keep them coming in. And until next time, I'm Johnny Wilkinson, and this has been I Am. This show is brought to you by Mags Creative. The executive producer is Megan Hill-Smith. Assistant producer is Alex Macy. 